Bom dia a todos. Meu nome é Leonardo Nemer Caldeira Brant. Eu presido o Centro de Direito Internacional, com sede em Belo Horizonte. É com muita alegria que eu saúdo a todos os presentes, saúdo igualmente os professores eh, internacionais e nacionais que irão estar conosco durante essas duas semanas, eh, durante o 16º curso de Direito Internacional. Eu gostaria de dizer que, em primeiro lugar, esse curso foi todo desenhado num novo modelo online. É, nós já estamos aí no 16º curso desse gênero. Ele foi totalmente adaptado às novas circunstâncias, o que, é, de certa forma, permitiu também uma extensão do número de participantes, de professores internacionais e nacionais participantes. Temos este ano 19 grandes nomes do direito internacional que estarão presentes conosco durante essas duas semanas. Num primeiro momento, portanto, eu gostaria de agradecer a todos os professores que colaboraram conosco, que estarão conosco nesse período, com palestras muito interessantes sobre temas dos mais variados do direito internacional. A todos eles, o meu muito obrigado. Em segundo lugar, saúdo e agradeço também aos alunos, aos estudantes que estão participando neste período de julho não é? conosco durante essas duas semanas. O nosso também, muito obrigado. Esse é um curso que envolve uma grande equipe do Centro de Direito Internacional, a qual eu tenho o imenso orgulho de colaborar e de presidir. Ele é um curso que pretende trazer para o Brasil e para a, a nossa América Latina o mesmo modelo de cursos que de forma quase centenária já é uma, uma tradição nos países europeus e nas principais universidades do mundo. Portanto, é para nós uma, uma grande satisfação que tenhamos ele já há mais de uma década no Brasil. O curso de inverno de Direito Internacional, com toda a sua abrangência e extensão, não seria possível de ser realizado igualmente se não fosse a relevante parceria e a confiança e o apoio da Fundação Conrad Adenauer no Brasil. A ela estendo um caloroso agradecimento e eh, tenho a certeza de que estamos contribuindo juntos para os valores do direito internacional, para os valores dos direitos humanos, para os valores do Estado Democrático de Direito, para os valores da democracia e, com certeza, para a compreensão e construção de um mundo, de um universo internacional mais justo e mais equilibrado. Portanto, agradeço de forma calorosa ao apoio da Fundação Conrada Adenal no Brasil. Gostaria, portanto, de dar início ao 16º curso de inverno de Direito Internacional, esperando que todos tenhamos Duas semanas de muitas atividades e aprendizado. Um forte abraço a todos. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Pierre Marie Dupuy, who is an emeritus professor at the University of Paris, Panteon Assas, and after being a visiting professor in several universities including Ann Harbor, Michigan. Professor Dupuy was on leave from Paris between 2000 and 2012, and was a professor at European University Institute in Florence, and at the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies in Geneva. Professor Dupuy is one of the founders of the European Journal of International Law, and I'm very important journal of this area, and has also led a double career as a scholar and a practitioner, and has written in almost every field of international law, including the general theory of international law, human rights, the law of international protection of the environment, and international investment law. He's also the author of a renowned textbook in international law, Le Précis de Droit International Public, which is now in its 14th edition. And as a practitioner, was involved in more than 20 cases before the International Court of Justice, being an active arbitrator as well 
for the ICSID, the PCA, and LCAA, and was the president of the ABE International Tribunal. Professor Dupuy is fluent in five languages and was awarded the 2015 American Society of International Law, mainly Hudson Medal, and is a member of the Institut de Droit International. He was also a professor in the Hague Academy of International Law, having done the general course on public international law in 2000. Today, Professor Dupuy will talk to us about 20 years later, how international law has evolved as a legal order. And I don't want to keep you anymore from having the pleasure of hearing Professor Dupuy. Professor Dupuy, please, you have the floor. Uh, dear colleague, I, I thank you very much. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be at the same time here in Europe in southern part of France, close to Nice, and in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Uh, that's thanks to modern technology. Uh, the title of this lecture was chosen by myself. It's 20 years later. For a Frenchman, this is a way to ironically uh, refer to a rather famous novel, French novel, of Alexandre Dumas. Uh, the novel, 20 years later, is simply the follow-up of a, a very known book of Alexandre Dumas, which was uh, The Three Musketeers. And this novel explains what happened 20 years after the end of the adventures which were told uh, by Dumas in his first uh, uh, novel. Um, I, the reason why I, I chose this title is because I delivered the general course of international law at the Hague Academy, as you rightly said, in 2000, 2000, exactly 2000, between 20 years ago. And I found it uh, as an interesting challenge to review uh, the theory that I developed during that period 20 years ago in order to see whether the actual practice of international law during this time confirmed or, on the contrary, uh, contradicted what I had taken the risk of explaining in my theory. Um, I'll come back on it very soon. Uh, what I would like just to pre make uh, more precise is that I shall speak of international law as, in technical terms, as a legal order, in the sense in which it was developed in particular by Hans Kelsen, by Santi Romano, by Georges Sell, or, of course, by Hart. Uh, which uh, was person, uh, particularly well known. Under uh, this concept of legal order, let's uh, start with uh, a, a very general attempt to define it as an organized set of norms establishing, at the very least, the way in which those norms are created and modified, as well as the relationship between the rights and obligation of the subjects to which they apply, and the consequences attached to their violations. Of course, there could be other elements to be put into the definition of what is a legal order, but I don't have time here to develop. Well, when I delivered my lecture uh, 20 years ago, it was a very nice time. Um, of course, for me, because I was 20 years uh, younger than now, but also because 2000 was not only the beginning of a new millennium. It was a time when you could be relatively reasonably optimistic as to the future and 
progressive development of international law as a legal order. That was a time when the Uruguay round, which has uh, established the World Trade Organization, was ended and WTO was already uh, actively uh, trying to reorganize the multilateral regulation of international trade with, as you know, um, uh, an element of quasi-judicial control which had been introduced by the Uruguay Round. 2000 was also a time when, looking back to the beginning of the earlier decades and to 1998, when the Rome, the new Rome Convention was adopted, one could see that a new development was had been achieved, that of international criminal law and the possibility to affirm that the individual is not only a passive subject of international law, but that the individual, the individual person can also bear international responsibility for the commission of international crimes as they are defined in uh, the Rome Convention of 1998. And that was, of course, promising. Moreover, uh, the Security Council had uh, demonstrated during the 90s that due to political reason, uh, the United Nations was, or had been at least for a short period of time, able to develop, enlarge, expand the very scope of the maintenance of peace. And I refer back, for instance, uh, in particular to the very uh, uh, stimulating agenda for peace, which had been adopted by the Security Council on the reports of its uh, uh, generally, general secretary of the time, who was uh, Boutros, Boutros Ghali. And finally, um, at the end of the 90s, the United Nations had been even given a very specific mandate, which so far he had not had an opportunity to practice, which was a territorial mandate, a territorial mandate on Kosovo. That brought some new difficulties. It was not a full success, but in any way, it was a demonstration that the United Nations as the world organization had a great potential to organize in a much more convincing way than in the past international peace. So I took this opportunity in 2000 for developing my own uh, theory of international law, which basically um, is aimed at demonstrating that contrary to uh, what too many people said at that time, and or some of them still are saying now, international law as an international order is not fragmented. I insist on that. On that. It is not fragmented. And why am I a bit, uh, I don't want to be arrogant, but why am I so sure to say that? Because what I said in 2000 has demonstrated, a bit demonstrated to be true. We still have only one international legal order. And that was at that time, there was a confusion between two distinct phenomena. One being complexity and complexification of international law, because a number of new fields of international relations were and still are covered by international law. Confusion between this complexification and fragmentation. There is no fragmentation because there are still two, two principles of unity 
of the international legal order. Two, two principles is that is that not a bit too much? It would be better, perhaps, or more efficient if we had only one principle of unity. Uh, yes, in an ideal world, perhaps, but we have, we are and ought we too, because such was the will of states. We are and ought with two kinds of unity. The first one is a very old classical one. It is formal unity. And I will explain what it is. And the second is a very new one in historical terms, because it was only created on a very precise date, which is 1969. It is material unity, and I will explain why, what I mean by that. Yes, indeed, delivering the general course of international law in 2000 was a jolly good opportunity, perhaps not as provocative as the new adventures of the four musketeers, because there were four and not three in reality, or at least in, in the novels of Dumas. But it was really interesting to share with uh, the audience of my lecture in The Hague, uh, where I saw the this uh, unity. Now, what I shall tend to do now is simply, first of all, in, my, in the first part of my presentation, um, to explain the theory of the two foundations of the unity. And then in a second part, I will confront the theory to uh, what effectively happened from 2000 to now, till now. Now let's first uh, start, begin by explaining in a bit more detail uh, this uh, dual unity, and I start with the formal unity. Formal unity, I can be relatively short because it's, as I already said, a very old and classical and well-known one. It was the one which was refounded in some way by the two famous Westphalian treaties in, uh, during the 17th century. But basically, you could go much further back in the history of humanity to find the formal unity of international law. When I was professor in Florence at the European University, I was happy enough to be to live quite close to the fantastic archaeological museum of Florence. And there was an exhibition, precisely when I was there, about the Treaty of Kadesh. I enjoyed it very much. I went to the archaeological museum at least four times. Why is that? Because that Treaty of Kadesh dates back to 1270, 1270, 1270 before Christus. Realize what that means. 1270 before Christ, Christus, because it was a treaty passed between Ramses the second, the big pharaoh, the most well, well known, if I can say so, and Hattusi Li, the emperor of the Hittites, and it dealt with Syria. Already at that time, Syria was creating international problems for peace. And that treaty, I could read it at the archaeological museum because it, it was written and transcribed, of course, in several languages. Um, and uh, had been translated, and it was a treaty like we are we we are used to read them with a preamble, a set of articles, concluding paragraph, and it was formulated in a classical modern way, so to say, which is a way to demonstrate that the way how to create obligations in international law was not really 
and renewed during over millenniums. And I spoke of treaties, but I could say the same uh, about customary international law. And by the way, it is interesting to see that treaty law is at least as old as customary international law in terms of history. To put it in a nutshell, what is the formal unity of international law? It is the unity of the technology of its norms. norms. Formal unity is composed of secondary rules of international law as they are defined by Hart in his very uh, famous book, The Object of Law. The legal, the legal order. Now, this formal unity was and still remain for much of it the same. I will come back on that when in my second part. What is the material unity? The material unity is very different because, first of all, it is very new. Very new, of course, in historical terms. You don't need to get back to uh, two millenniums before Christus. No, you find it only, as I already mentioned the date, in 1969. What is 1969? Of course, you already recognize the date of the year when the International Convention on the Law of Treaties was adopted in Vienna. And as you know, the uh, Convention on the Law of Treaty contains a series of provisions, including one which is stated at Article 53, which I think is worth to be cited again so that you keep it in mind. Article 3, the title is Treaties Conflicting with a Peremptory Norm of General International Law, use COVID. And the provision lays down a treaty is voice if, void if at the time of its conclusion it conflicts with a peremptory norm of general international law. For the purpose of the present convention, a peremptory norm of general international law is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a war, as a norm for which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only <clears throat> by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. So, two very important elements in this provision. First, <clears throat> Peremptory international law does not fall down from the sky. It is the reflect of the acceptance of states. So we remain in a voluntaristic framework, the basis of obligations for states remaining in a very classical way, agreement of states. Second, Article 53 speaks of the international community of states as a whole. Community of states. How well can say a number of uh, skeptic minds. Community, international community. We, we, we know this uh, expression and we know that in reality there is no real community. Now, just a second, please. Just a second, we are among lawyers. Are you familiar with the notion of legal fiction? What is a legal fiction? A legal fiction is something which has perhaps not much to do with facts, but which is a true reality in law. One international law says that every state are equal. It's a legal fiction. 
they are not equal in economic or in military terms. We all of us know that, but legally speaking, they are absolutely equal. It's a legal fiction. When you say in Brazilian law, as we say it in French law, that nobody is supposed to ignore what is the content of the law. We all know that it is not true, even after our uh, very systematic studies of law. We don't know the law in all its details, but as a legal fiction, we have to start from the fact that every citizen knows the law. So there is nothing more true in law than a legal fiction. Another issue is to know whether in reality the international community exists, because I would tell you the answer is a moving one. There are some issues, some topics, some periods during which the international community of states, and not only of states, but also the international community, including NGOs and the civil society, concur in agreeing on the, having, sharing the same views and the same values. Because what is important is that material unity has taken the risk of being established on the basis of values incorporated into the law by the community of states as a whole. And the community of states as a whole is, so to say, the legislator of those parentary norms. Now, this is brand new as compared to the formal unity. Formal unity is not hierarchical. There is no hierarchy between treaty and custom. But there is a hierarchy between parentry norms and only compulsory ones. You cannot derogate the first. You can establish derogation to the second. So you, you can see that there is nothing more different than the two kinds of unity. And that, of course, at a certain point, there could be a conflict among the two of them. And I shall get back to one case in which I was involved as a, a counsel for one of the countries. It is the case of Germany versus Italy, 12, um, uh, 2012, where the court was confronted to kind of a conflict between uh, uh, perhaps not formal and material unity, but even worse, between two conflicting elements of material unity. We will come back on that. Now, I think it's time for us to get to the second part of this presentation. Now that you have, I think, more or less understood my distinction, I recall that, uh, of course, as every general course of international law, the course uh, uh, that I delivered in 2000 has been published in the uh, Recueil uh, de l'Académie de l'International. It is in a Latin language, written in a Latin language, just like Portuguese language is. And this Latin language, which still remains the, the other official language of the International Court of Justice, is namely French. So I encourage you to read French, even if you believe that you cannot speak it. Anyway. Second part, the theory of the two foundations of unity put to the test of reality since the year 20, two, uh, 2000. Sorry. Well, this period began in a very tragic way. I refer back, of course, to what happened only one short year 
after the delivery of my lecture, which was 9-11. 9-11 was the start of the in globalization of Islamic terrorism and demonstrated that this community, not only of states, but also of people, was threatened by private groups, or for some of them groups which were maneuvered, controlled sometimes by states, which are terrorists. Currently, we speak less of terrorism because of the pandemic, which is another way to experience the globalization of the world, but international terrorism will get back and is still one of one of the worst worst challenges. Now let's go rather quickly through those two kinds of unity, formal and uh, material, in order to see what are, in my view, we can discuss that afterwards the main evolutions. As far as formal unity, I will be short, I would say there is no, not much to be said, or there is to be said, but basically, as I experienced it as a practitioner, the way how to deal with uh, the law and international law in particular remains the same when you are uh, a, a council for before the court or an arbitrator uh, within the exit, for instance, uh, you deal with norms according to uh, what the secondary rules establish as to the uh, control and management of primary rules. Now, still, I would mention an interesting evolution which concerns secondary rules, namely the international responsibility of states and international responsibility of state belongs to secondary rules according to Hart's uh, distinction because uh, the responsibility is second to the violation of primary ones. Okay, what is interesting is that during that very period, 20 years, there was an important evolution in the, in, in the fact that the international responsibility of states does not uh, uh, deal only with the past, as it did it earlier, but also with the future. With the future, how is that? It is because of what the International Law Commission under Article 30B of its draft said when it indicates that states respons the state responsible for the internationally wrongful act is under an obligation if it is a continuing breach of the law to offer appropriate assurances and guarantees of non-repetition and non-repetition belongs to the future. And thanks to uh, the way in which states, a series of states presenting that case before the ICJ during those 20 years, very quickly the transfer from progressive development to positive international law was realized thanks to the case law of the ICJ. Look to the Lagrange case, Germany, uh, United States, Cameroon, Nigeria, then and Maritime Boundary, Avena, Mexico versus United States, Armed activities on the territory of the Congo Democratic Republic, Congo, Uganda. Genocide case, 
Bosnia and Herzegovina versus Serbia. Two cases between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. The pork mill case between Argentina and Uruguay. The jurisdictional immunities of the state case between Germany and Italy are cases in which you can find that first one of the claimants and then the court accepted to say that in the case of the establishment of the violation of a primary uh, rule by a continuous wrongful act, the court, the, the country which is responsible must offer guarantees of non-repetition. That is important because in a way it's an enlargement of the scope and field of the international responsibility of the court. Second, I would like to mention an important element also, which perhaps I won't have time to develop very much here, which is that we did not make very many progresses, uh, much progress, let's say, <clears throat> in the differentiation between the international regime of two kinds of liabilities, the one which is uh, the result of the violation of their obligations, and the one which is, and which should be aggravated, constituted by the violation of a parentary norm. And that is perhaps not that much the fault of the court itself, because if you, once again, if you get back to the very interesting um, draft articles of the ILC, you will see that the reading of articles 42 and 48 does not provide any comprehensive and substantial legal differentiation of regime for the two situations. I have no time to go further, but I uh, wrote an article on that uh, in a um, book which was published under the responsibility of Professor Antonio Cassese, um, uh, which I think is a very important one, uh, which is called Realizing Utopia and deals with what could and should be the uh, future of international law as a legal order. Let's now, in the second sub part of the second uh, part of this uh, lecture about the, evolu uh, the evolution of the material unity, the evolution of that kind of unity of which I told you that it was such a revolutionary one as compared to the formal one. Well, it's basically a question of opinion euro. Whether a norm is interpreted as simply compulsory or as imperative depends on what the entity which will qualify it consider as to its social importance. Yes, indeed. Qualifying a norm as peremptory has a political dimension, a political potential. And this is one of the cases where you can see that this new kind of unity is a principle of unity, but at the same time is full of potential conflicts. Because the way how to consider whether a norm is socially important or not has much to do with ideologies, with the Weltanschauung, with the vision of states, and not all of them agree about this. To say the minimum. Now, 
We deal now with the substance of rules, material unity. And there we find an interesting provision back into the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which has been established, as you all know, if you are already well trained in international law, which is to be found at Article 31.3c of the Vienna Convention, which indicates that the interpretation of any treaty obligation should be, if needed, interpreted in the light of, I quote, any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties, which is far rich. It means that you, at least in some cases, in order to establish and define precisely what is the content of a treaty obligation, for instance, Brazil in the bilateral treaty with Argentina, you would have to look not only to what the provisions of that bilateral treaty say, but also to other provisions of other treaties to which the two of them are parties. For instance, the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. Brazil and Argentina are the two for the two of them parties to that convention. And then if you apply 313C of the Vienna Convention, you could be confronted, or the judge at least in particular, could be confronted to the necessity of verifying how to interpret the provisions of that in my example, bilateral treaty, taking into consideration the much larger obligation set out in the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. So it's far reaching. And some of the most advanced uh, scholars um, say, and I'm referring in particular to my colleague Campbell McLachlan, who was um, a member of the ILC at the time when uh, the project on fragmentation was, which led uh, to no real convention, uh, was examined by the ILC. Campbell McLachlan said, oh, but we are here and dot with a real principle of in normative integration an integrative principle, which is the best way to uh, avoid the fragmentation of international law, which is a true principle or rule within material unity to warranty this unity, this substantial material unity. Now, just a moment. We have to see what the international judge, limiting ourselves here with the ICJ, did with this provision. And to be short, the court used it in several cases, uh, about six of them, uh, but in a limited way. For instance, uh, I can give you an example in the case between Djibouti and France in 2008, uh, the uh, agreement between the two countries was, uh, uh, for, for settling dispute, was interpreted in the light of the uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, to which the two sides were and are party. But one could hardly say that the court did a very systematic or even less systemic use of this potential principle of integration. And there is not much surprise about this. It is because the court is composed of a bench of lawyers coming from different legal cultures. They 
very much tend to limit themselves to what the statute, which uh, controls, the governs them, says. And Article 38 of the statute of the uh, uh, International Court of Justice points to the, as much as possible, the uh, obligations which are directly involved at stake in for the settlement of the dispute. So let me just conclude on that. I cannot be too long by saying, yes, indeed, 313C is a tremendous potential for guaranteeing, if de developed by the judge, the integration, the normative integration of international law. But so far, the court has been very careful. And doing a little bit of court from experience, I would tell you, I think that its trend will be to remain rather uh, 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 careful with this. Now, in the sense that qualification of a norm in order to decide whether it is compulsory or much more peremptory, which means non uh, uh, able to be derogated. Qualification is part of interpretation, and interpretation is, once again, first of all, the role of the judge. The internal judge, by the way, as well as the international judge. And it is extremely interesting to see how, since, since the entry into force of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, uh, municipal uh, uh, judges, starting of course with constitutional judges, have used, but not only constitutional judges, have referred to this hierarchy, this normative hierarchy of norms in international law. Now, to be uh, concise as to the overall review of the court's uh, uh, jurisprudence during the last 20 years, I would say that there is a paradox. First of all, we had to wait until 2006 and 2007, 2006 on activities on the territory of the Congo, Congo Rwanda, and then 2007, the genocide case between Bosnia and Serbia. We had to wait until then for reading in the text of a judgment by the court that there is at least one norm which is peremptory in character. And that norm was the prohibition of genocide. The paradox is that in, in reality, the court, I'm speaking not of the permanent court, but the, of its success as the ICJ, almost uh, since its very start in 1949, had already begun by using this hierarchy of norms. Speaking, for instance, in the Corfu Channel case of elementary consideration of humanity, or in the 51 advisory opinion on reservation to the Convention to gen on Genocide, to obligations which are compulsory even for those states which have not ratified the Convention on the Prohibition of Genocide. Or the 1986 very famous Nicaragua United States case where the uh, court points to the cardinal obligations of humanitarian law. Or 10 years later, the 1996 advisory opinion 
on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons to see that the court speak of untransgressible principles of international customary law. Because, of course, peremptory norms belong to customary international law. And in 2004, the very interesting advisory opinion on the war in the occupied Palestinian territory referred back to this qualification of intransgressible principles of international law. In other words, you had already the reality of peremptory norms recognized by the court before 2006 and 2007, but without saying it in some traditions, religious tradition, you cannot pronounce the name of God. Here, you, it seems like if the court had difficulties to pronounce the name of peremptory norms, even if, as I said earlier, peremptory norms don't fall down from the sky, but grow out of the agreement of states. Now, among the very many cases in which I was involved as counsel, one of my most recent cases was the case uh, between Germany and Italy. Um, I had difficulties to convince my uh, wife that I could accept to be counsel of Italy because my wife is German and because I had twice been counsel for Germany in the Lagrange case, uh, Germany won, and the uh, certain uh, uh, expenses, uh, no, certain expenses, in the, in, in the, in the Liechtenstein Germany. But to be serious, that was a very interesting case. And I accepted the offer by my good friend and illustrious colleague, uh, Luigi Condorelli, to be a council of Italy. We knew, we knew from the start that we could not win the case. And by the way, if you lose a case, it does not mean necessarily that you were not a good advocate. It may also mean that you could not win the case because the conditions were not uh, put together to win it. And here we had a situation in which we could not gain the case. And if we had another case of that kind, we could not either win it. Why is that? because there was a conflict. I announced that at the beginning of my lecture. There was a conflict between two kinds of norms. On the one hand, the sacrosanctity of the equality of states. Jurisdictional immunity of a state before the national courts of another state. Immunity. A Brazilian court cannot accept to judge another sovereign state because there is a principle of immunity. And this principle derives from a quasi constitutional principle of the legal order, international legal order, which is the equality of state. Now, on the other side, you had the principle according to which you must respect fundamental principles of humanitarian law. But what, because what was at stake was the fact that former victims of the Nazi regime had never received any kind of repair from Germany, although they had asked for it several times. And the court was confronted to that. And we knew as defenders 
for Italy that we could not make it because of the principle of equality or the principle of immunity, immunity of jurisdiction, which directly derived from it. But we had at least the hope that the court would open a little window by saying that in the future, under certain conditions, and if the practice of state could uh, indicate this direction, one could consider and so on. Nothing of the kind. Now, you will tell me, but Professor, you seem to forget that only a few months later, on the same year of 2012, the court spoke again of international peremptory norms, and that time in a very positive way, because it said that uh, the locus standi of uh, uh, Belgium was based of, on the very nature of uh, the uh, uh, principles which were at stake, which is the prohibition of torture. Prohibition of torture established by a convention to which both Belgium and Senegal were and are a party. And the court did that, rightly so. And this is important. But you cannot compare the two cases. And I repeat, if you come back to the court with a kind of situation like the one in Germany, Italy, no hope to win the case on the part of those the tribunals of which have accepted to know of a case in which another sovereign state is concerned. Here in the Belgium-Senegal case, what was at stake was simply whether Senegal was bound by this obligation. Pacta sum servanda. But the court did much out of that because the court wanted to send the message that it did not forget what is the importance of peremptory norms in the international legal order. And that is a motive of hope, which was in some way confirmed very recently, even if it was soon only at a, a, a procedural phase, which was the case of Gambia, uh, uh, which deals with uh, the um, uh, um, 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 Rohingyas, Gambia against uh, uh, um, um, uh, <laughs> Myanmar. Okay. It, but so far, this case is at the very beginning of its de development. Of course, simply accepted to know of uh, or, or to deliver provisional measures because of the very nature of the rights involved, the breach of which being able to create an irreparable damage, which is one of the conditions of acceding to the claim. Now, I conclude. I conclude by saying that, yes, indeed, material unity and the um, qualification of norms depends of the judge, but also of the states. And what did the states during the last 20 years? For some of which very good thing, but for much the worse. We have seen in the past from part of important states which you will easily recognize, annexation of territory by force, which is clearly incompatible with the UN Charter and which is a breach of peremptory norms. No reaction or just uh, 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 condemnations, but oral condemnations. We have seen and we are seeing a number of cases where multilateralism as a principle, which means 
international solidarity among states is being systematically attacked, starting again from a limited and narrow vision of nationalism and territorial sovereignty. And I wrote an article on one aspect of that, which was recently published in the Brazilian Journal of International. I don't think they are here. And even during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen that once again, uh, an important head of state criticized multilateralism and decided that USA would not be anymore a member of the WTO. It is not my case here to, to say that the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization has done everything in the right way. But what is at stake? She, as a condition for the uh, maintenance of uh, the material unity is precisely the respect of solidarity. But I'm still, nevertheless, rather optimistic because of the demonstration of concrete condemnations of this position by the largest majority of countries. And it is important in that respect, of course, to read every day the newspapers, which I recall was considered by Georg Hegel, the German philosopher, as a new way to pray every day as a member of international community precisely. Now, solidarity as a basis of the material unity has received only five days ago a wonderful homage by a Portuguese speaking, very eminent person for whom I have the greatest admiration. I'm speaking of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Guterres. Then let me end this lecture by calling what he said at on the opportunity of Nelson Mandela's uh, 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 anniversary of days. I quote, as Nelson Mandela said, one of the challenges of our time is to reinstill in the consciousness of our people the sense of human solidarity. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced this message more strongly than ever. Today, in demonstrations for racial equality, in campaigns against, against hate speech, in the struggles of people claiming their right and standing for future generations, we see the beginnings of a new movement. Will we succumb to chaos, division, and inequality? Or will we right the wrong of the past and move forward together? We are at a breaking point, but we know which side of the history we are on. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Dupree, for a very enlightening and with this touch of the present at your ending. I have here a few questions by the students that I wrote, but also I would like to start with um, asking you about the court, the International Court of Justice. I just wanted to say that by chance I was at The Hague when the case, the hearings of the case of Liechtenstein in Germany for the portrait was on. And I walked in and I, I sat for an hour or two and, and Crawford was talking about the Sleeping Beauty and his cell went on and it was 
such a riot that day. And, and you mentioned the role of the ICJ in a few cases on your lecture and started a comment on how the court has been careful on interpreting the Vienna Convention. And you have a particular and profound notion of the work of the ICJ and 20 years ago as well, you wrote on the statutes of the international legal system and the role of the ICJ. At that time, you noticed the fragmentation of the court system and the lack of guidance from the ICJ into international law as a whole, especially because at that time, new courts were coming up as International Criminal Court, and, and we have more that at a certain point, there was only the ICJ, and now we have a series of courts with particular jurisdiction. So how do you think the court, the ICJ has evolved in this last 10, 20 years? Do you think the court has assumed a central role as Professor Ortega Vicuña and Christopher Pinto report pointed out. And if you want to say anything about this specific composition of this court of today, because you mentioned a few cases of 2006 and seven, and you mentioned that the court has a certain composition at that time. Do you think it makes a big difference the composition of today in the role of the ICJ? Okay, I, I thank you very much for this very, uh, and multiple, uh, <laughs> Multi interesting big, and multiple question. Um, let me start by saying that uh, you kindly refer to an article which I wrote in 1999, which was just before um, uh, my, the delivery of my lecture. And at that time, the uh, president of the International Court of Justice, who uh, was a Frenchman, Juge Gilbert Guillot, very eminent and qualified, uh, uh, delivered a speech at the um, annual uh, session of the uh, General Assembly of the UN, as every year. And he was the one in 2000 who insisted on the danger of having a fragmentation of international case law. And he pleaded for having the ICJ as kind of a upper uh, international court, which would guarantee the unity of uh, jurisprudence, and which means interpretation of international law. In that respect, I think that his statement was extremely useful and important. Perhaps it contributed to the fact that we can say 20 years later that although a number of new courts were constituted without even speaking of the multitude of international arbitration tribunals, in particular in the uh, uh, in the field of uh, the settlement of disputes between um, private investors, foreign investors and states. Although there was such a multiplication of judges and international tribunals, there was not a real fragmentation, just the contrary. I would say that a reference to the uh, jurisprudence of the ICJ uh, is more and more important. And I'm involved in a case which, I, of course, I cannot indicate because it is still uh, under consideration, where I already know that the final decision of the tribunal will refer back to the position of the ICJ in a certain field. So yes, indeed, the ICJ does remain for a series of reasons, that because it is the principal legal judicial organ of the UN, the uh, body which can play a significant role. As you have seen, my judgment as to its jurisprudence is very nuanced. Uh, 
uh, I would have liked, as for me, that much earlier in time, the court qualifies certain obligations as peremptory. I would have liked that, although the law is still not quite well codified in that field, the court distinguish between the different legal regimes of responsibility. I would, of course, even more have liked, as counsel to Italy, that the court does not establish, as it unfortunately did, and I think it is, it, it is uh, a technical mistake, kind of a barrier between primary rules and procedural ones and uh, secondary rules. I think this is a nonsense, if I may say so, because per essence, the definition of secondary rules is to be at the service uh, of the respect of primary rules. So you cannot simply say um, the principle of immunity of states belongs to proceed rule, uh, 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 rules. Uh, this is one thing, and this is distinct from uh, primary rules which are at stake with uh, uh, the respect of uh, uh, humanitarian uh, obligations. But that being said, as I ended uh, uh, my lecture, I still have very much respect and hope in the court, which is by definition the judicial body which can contribute to the maintenance of unity. You ask me about the composition of the court. I mean, it's difficult to speak of that, not only because I know most of the judges, but because one way or the other, due to the uh, uh, permanent change in composition of the court, uh, a renewal of its composition, and the fact that uh, so far the court uh, or the countries, uh, that the General Assembly and Security Council have uh, uh, succeeded in maintaining the representability of uh, the uh, international uh, legal culture within the composition of the court, it would make no sense to say that one court in its composition of that date is better than the other. There is kind of ways of a balancing. Um, of course, at the very beginning of it, you had big stars within the court, just like Hirschlauter part. Uh, or uh, Alejandro Alvarez uh, for the uh, Latin American countries. And they played a very important role, or, or, or uh, Jules Badvon. Uh, but you have also excellent judges within the court, not of all of them being of the same te technical quality. I think what is important, what is important is that every judge, as much as possible, remains independent from his own state, from its national uh, state. That is a, a big condition. And that is, in principle, respected. Thank you. Uh, I will now pass to the questions of the students. I have five or six questions here. And I go, do you want me to just Go one by one, I think. And okay. Fernando Porto Sá asked that, Professor, in the title of this lecture, you refer to the international order. Why do you conceive it as another rather than, for example, a system? Okay. Okay, that's a good, very good question. Uh, and I deal with it in the text, the written text of uh, uh, the article out of which I made this presentation. Uh, it's a good question because I don't think that the two of them are exactly equivalent. And it is all the more important that um, it's also, it's a question of culture and it's a question of, uh, uh, of language. Uh, in English, you don't find very often the term international legal order, but you find it. Uh, and for instance, Herschel Autopath spoke always of international legal order. 
Uh, whereas in other languages, uh, you find the term order. Uh, for instance, in Italian, it, uh, and by the way, Italian, Italy is uh, one of the uh, legal cultures which by far most contributed to the development of doctrine in international law. Santi Romano, to, which I, to whom I referred, wrote a book, the title of which is L'Ordinamento Giuridico, L'Ordinamento Giuridico, not Il Sistema Internazionale, no? L'Ordinamento Giuridico, which means that there is encapsulated in the concept of order, a certain kind of hierarchy, a system may remain horizontal. An order means what it means, which means that in some respect, even before the explicit formulation of Article 53 of the Vienna Convention, you had a certain standing organization of the relation between rules and uh, uh, subjects of law and violations as to the consequences of violation of obligations of the subjects um, uh, with regard to uh, their obligation. So legal order goes further than international system. I say that very often to my English speaking friends. I say that because you referred to him and he's a, a good friend of mine. I say that to James Crawford. I told him, James, I'm sorry, but you should speak of international order more often. And he said, Pierre, you, you're right. And I'll do it as much as possible, but you cannot change the language that easily and the traditions, but he agreed with me that the two are not equivalent and that we are confronted with an order as far as international is concerned. Interesting. Um, Rodrigo Franco asks, Professor, how can one assure a material completeness of a legal order rely on principles as Lauter Park is voted for without compromising its purely legal character. Is it possible to identify such principles without resort to subjectivity? Is the International Law Commission draft on principles succeeding in that direction, in your opinion? Well, uh, that's once again a very good question. Um, and one of the critics, uh, criticism uh, exercise against you, Scogans, from the start was to say, well, you know, we, you, you speak of uh, peremptory norms that you don't know, you are not able to say what it is. You cannot say what are the rules which uh, are not, uh, which are peremptory. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, Jan Brownlee even said once, uh, well, it, it's a nice vehicle, but it remains in the garage. I'm sorry, but once again, I had several that I do not agree with what my good friend Jan Brownlee said. Uh, one may perfectly identify, perfectly identify normative peremptory norms. The problem, and this is was why I am thankful to this, uh, to, to having the person who asked this question. The problem is that you find there, again, kind of attention, because some of them, the majority of them are simply crucial human rights, all the rights which directly belong to the respect of dignity of the human being which means already quite a lot. And we saw, for instance, that torture would be one. As by the way, the very, very active inter-American court of human rights say has begun to say it for decades now. And 
I must say I'm very, very respectful and admirative for the work delivered by the Inter-American Court. So you can easily draw the, the, the list. And by the way, if you want a formal criterion for individualizing those human rights principles which are non-derogable, please go to Article 14 on the covenant of the covenant on civil rights. And you will see that there is an indication of those rights which are not able to accept derogation. That's a formal criterion for identif identifying material. Now, the problem is that there are other principles, the beneficiaries of which are not the human being, but the states. And I mentioned, I didn't say, I did not say that the immunity of jurisdiction principle is such a principle, but I said that the principle of equality of state so far is a constitutional principle. And I could elaborate uh, upon it. You can modify the constitution. You could also modify a parentry uh, rule. But anyway, it's distinct. Whatever the case may be, the problem is that there is a potential of clashes between some principles and others. And this is indeed not necessarily a weakness, but a difficulty in the stabilization of the corpus juris of peremptory norms. And there, the ICJ, to go back to your question, could of course, and will perhaps, I hope, play an important role. It's, it's a question of time. And we can hope that the degradation of the human environment will leave us enough time for watching the court expanding its case law. Okay, I have here another three questions. And we do not have more than six, seven minutes. So I will put to you okay. Okay. the three questions and you decide okay. 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 what you think it's best to answer. Ana Lucia Bajia said, Professor Dupuy, good afternoon. In this complexity of international law, how do you think international law can make a concrete contribution to a sustainable development? and continuing, especially in relation to transnational companies. Moisés Montiel, Professor, you have mentioned that the peremptory norms are essentially customary law. Would you mind elaborating on this idea, seeing as the theory of imperative law is still very underdeveloped? And finally, Igor Jolanda, Professor, considering Considering the Article 66 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, do you believe that already exists a compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ when the object of the dispute is the interpretation or application of an international use cohen norm? In this case, it would be restricted to those who are signatories to the Convention so these are the three final questions. If you need me to repeat anything, and uh, could you could could you please repeat a little bit the first of the three questions? I'm not sure that yes. I got it exactly. Yes, Ana Lucia Bajia asked that in the complexity of international law, how do you think international law can make a concrete contribution to a sustainable development? To sustainable okay. development. And she's uh, concerned of this question in relation to transnational companies. Okay, so okay. we have another five minutes. So you decide uh, okay, okay. what do you want to do with this? Okay. Uh, well, first question, uh, I, I, I think very much that um, sustainable development 
uh, needs to be de developed uh, in its uh, content and implications in particular because from uh, the uh, Rio Declaration uh, of 1992 onwards, uh, it was not definitely uh, enough uh, uh, developed and defined. So uh, we could hope that it will be uh, developed by basically by the states. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the uh, successive uh, COM, um, uh, which means uh, meetings of uh, the uh, Paris Agreement are very important because they not only deal with climate change as such, but with the whole uh, global environment. And that could be, of course, or one could even derive from any future real progress uh, in that respect, uh, what is to be understood under sustainable development, which I define very often more than uh, as a conceptual matrix as a true principle. But still, we have reached a concrete point where we can watch, and by the way, COVID-19 does belong to the environmental problematic, because you know why uh, COVID-19 was uh, provoked in particular by the restriction of the area of life of some uh, wild animal species. So it's, it's clearly connected. So we are in such a trouble now with this uh, scale of danger and uh, uh, challenges that we still have to hope and the international civil society has here a role to play. Uh, to put uh, the governments under pressure so that they develop what is to be understood under sustainable development. You cannot expect from the court that it will say much more than what was already said by it in the Gapshikovo Nagi Marosh case in 1997. Second question. Well, I don't agree at all with the person who said that customary international law is that far not very well developed. It is the object of interpretation, but customary international law is as old as uh, the history of uh, international legal orders. And as I said, there was already one during the time of the Kadesh Treaty and a good and large part of of international law does remain customary in essence, is being codified and we must pay tribute to the fantastic work which has been so far done by the ILC. And as far as the belonging to uh, uh, of peremptory norms to customary international law, after having said that the ILC has so well worked, I must say that I'm a bit anxious about the present state of the first reports on peremptory norms because I don't want uh, to uh, be too critical, but it sounded that the special reporter was not absolutely sure whether by treating peremptory norms, he also dealt with customary international law. I'm sorry to refer back to one of the um, uh, semantic the fundamental articles, which was written in French by Professor Michel Virali in the Annuaire Francais de Droit International back in the 60s. Uh, what is, qu'est-ce que le droit impératif? What is use comments? And you will find here the perfect definition of the fact that per essence, customary peremptory uh, norms belong to uh, uh, um, good question also, and last question on 66. 
Um, I would say yes, so far, uh, an action before the court based on 66 will, would be so far restricted to uh, states, parties to the convention, or at least it would be much easier to having as a state its locus standi recognized if such a request emanates from a state member of the Vienna, Con Vienna Convention. And by that, I, I think we have to start. I think we reach our time. It was a great pleasure to meet you, not in person as I would desire, but um, with this distance, at least it was possible for all of us to be together. And I thank you very much. And I hope you stay healthy in the Southern France and enjoy the very nice summer in France. And I thank, well, I thank you as well. well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I reciprocate my wishes. Okay. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. A great pleasure. I will leave now. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye.